vaccinations. You might have some questions. Why are school vaccinations important? What vaccinations are required for school? And what is public health's role in school vaccinations? They increase our herd immunity in our community. They decrease rates of vaccine preventable diseases and they decrease complications related to vaccine preventable disease. Here you'll see a picture about herd immunity. This is from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. The top picture, people are not immunized but still healthy. And then you have two not immunized, sick and contagious people. You'll see that no one is immunized and contagious disease spreads through the population. In the middle picture, some of the population gets immunized. Contagious disease spreads through some of the population. The people that are immunized are still protected. In the last picture, most of the population gets immunized and the spread of contagious disease is contained. It also protects those who cannot be immunized. This is a vaccine preventable diseases chart by the American Academy of Pediatrics and the CDC. You'll see the list of vaccine preventable diseases, um, hepatitis B, hepatitis A, rotavirus, diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, etc. It has the vaccine that protects against the disease, how the disease is spread, disease symptoms, as well as disease complications. When the child is a little older, they come up with a different chart, seven to 18 years, and you'll see HPV is added, meningococcal disease is added, as well as dengue fever. Childhood vaccination prevents four million deaths each year, and a lack of access to vaccines can leave children at risk of death, disability, and illness from preventable diseases. I have three examples for you. Example one is chickenpox. Complications include bacterial infections of the skin and soft tissues in children, pneumonia, otherwise known as infection of the lungs, encephalitis or cerebellar ataxia, infection or swelling of the brain, hemorrhagic complications, like bleeding problems, sepsis, which is bloodstream infections, and dehydration. Chickenpox related deaths in the US have decreased dramatically since the vaccine. You can see in the image presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Chickenpox is very contagious. If one person has it, nine out of 10 people close to that person who are not immune will also become infected with chickenpox. It can also be serious, even life-threatening, especially in babies, adolescents, adults, pregnant women, and people with weakened immune systems. Before the vaccine was available, about 4 million people got chickenpox each year in the United States. Over 10,500 of those people were hospitalized and about 100 to 150 people died. Half of those deaths were among children. Now chickenpox is rare in the United States. With fewer than 150,000 cases, 1,400 hospitalizations, and 30 deaths each year. My second example is polio. You'll see the chart presented by the CDC on poliomyelitis when the inactivated vaccine was available and the live oral vaccine. And the cases dropped dramatically after those were introduced. Complications include meningitis, paralysis, where you can't move parts of your body, there's both flaccid, which is weakness in the arms, legs, or both, and bulbar types. Bulbar is speech, breathing, and swallowing difficulties. Post-polio syndrome, which is development of new muscle pain, weakness, or paralysis as adults, which can occur 15 to 40 years later. Polio virus is very contagious and spreads through person-to-person -person contact. It lives in an infected person's throat and intestines, it can contaminate food and water in unsanitary conditions. It enters the body through the mouth. 
and it spreads through contact with the feces of an infected person or droplets from a sneeze or cough of an infected person. There is no cure for polio, but it can be prevented with safe and effective vaccination. The vaccine protects children by preparing their bodies to fight the polio virus. Almost all children who get the recommended doses of inactivated polio vaccine will be protected from polio. My third example is diphtheria. Complications of diphtheria include blocking of the airway, damage to the heart muscles, polyneuropathy, which is nerve damage, paralysis, respiratory failure or pneumonia, and death. You'll see here the chart presented by the CDC on the dropping rates after the vaccine was introduced. Diphtheria is a highly contagious acute bacterial disease that usually affects the tonsils, throat, nose, or skin. The bacteria produce a toxin that damages cells and destroys body tissues. The toxin produced is absorbed into the bloodstream and travels throughout the body. Transmission of diphtheria is by respiratory secretions, draining lesions, or less commonly fomites, which are things that you touch like a door handle or a computer keyboard, and then somebody else comes along and touches it next and obtains the bacteria or the virus. Diphtheria was once a major cause of illness and death among children. United States recorded 206,000 cases and 15, over 15,000 deaths in 1921. Between 2012 and 2018, there were only three recorded cases in the United States. Diphtheria toxoid vaccine was developed in the early 1920s, but it wasn't used until the early 1930s in a, in a wide manner. Okay, so we've answered why are school vaccinations important? So let's cover the next question. What vaccines are required for school? <laughs> the required school vaccines for grades K through 12 are four polio, five DTaP, three Hep B, two MMRs, and two varicella. For the seventh through 12th grade, you would need all the K through 12 doses, as well as one dose of Tdap. In order to advance to the seventh grade, you need that one dose of Tdap and the two varicella doses. California schools are required to check immunization records for all new student admissions at the TK kindergarten through 12th grade and all students advancing to the seventh grade before entry. They are allowed to unconditionally admit a pupil whose parent or guardian has provided receipt of immunization or a permanent me medical record exemption for each immunization required for the pupil's age or grade. They're allowed to conditionally admit any pupil who lacks documentation if the pupil has commenced receiving doses of all of the vaccines required for the pupil's grade and is not currently due for any doses at the time of admission, or they have a temporary medical exemption. Continued attendance after conditional admission is contingent upon documentation of receipt of the remaining required immunizations. For a pupil transferring from another school, you'd want to admit that child for up to 30 school days if the immunization record has not been received. Exemptions are done using Care Me, the California Immunization Registry Medical Exemption website. It's a secure site for physicians to issue and manage standardized medical exemptions for children in school or childcare. Parents use the same site to request medical exemptions from vaccination for their children. Schools and childcare facilities can monitor and get updates for medical exemptions issued for children in attendance. Exemptions may be allowed for the following medical conditions, anaphylaxis, encephalopathy, severe immunodeficiency, or the physician may specify a different condition. The list of exempted vaccines with date of onset and if the condition is permanent or temporary. If it's temporary, the physician must identify the date in which it expires. These are the recommended immunizations for children from birth through six years old. Not all of them are required for school. 
Here's the same chart, but for children from the ages of 7 to 18. The conditional vaccine schedule shows when the earliest dose may be given and when to exclude the child from school if they have not received the dose. Now that we've covered which vaccines are required for school, what is the public health's role in school vaccinations? Your local public health takes a role in tracking school vaccination rates, tracking infectious diseases, offering public health vaccine clinics, offering health education, being a local provider contact, and assist schools to increase vaccination rates. Here you'll see some flyers for our Tdap clinics in Calusa County at all of the local libraries. And here we have a flyer for our COVID clinics. Here's something we have our children fill out when they come to get a vaccine. It helps them remain more comfortable during vaccination if we know what they prefer to do while they're getting their vaccines. We found out that this has helped with vaccination anxiety quite a bit um, in our children. So now that we've answered all of your questions on school vaccinations, vaccines that are required for school, and public health's role, you might have more questions. That's where more resources come in. We have resources for schools and for parents, such as Shots for School, Let's Rise, and Vaccinate with Confidence. Shots for School is where parents can find information about which immunizations their child needs before starting school or childcare. School and child care staff can find tools to help implement California's immunization requirements. Let's Rise is a CDC initiative to provide actionable strategies, resources, and data to support getting all Americans back on schedule with their routine immunizations to protect everyone from vaccine preventable disease and disability. Vaccinate with Confidence is CDC's strategic framework to strengthen vaccine confidence and prevent outbreaks of vaccine preventable diseases in the United States. Their goals are to protect communities, empower families, and stop myths. And you can review the resources we've used in these slides. I'd like to thank the CDC, CDPH, Immunize.org, ShotsForSchool.org, as well as all of the public health personnel that assist with school vaccinations. Thank you.